squeeze the car between a car and a wall like that. You didn't have the room. 89, you're a moron. DJ, yeah. we've got some after race stuff. Oh, they're wrecking each other. And as we got Blaskowski up in the wall, is. Oh, this is tempers flaring. Uh, welcome into the second episode of Tempers Flaring. Uh, I'm here with Brock again. Cash is making, I think, what is this, your second appearance or first? This is my first. Oh, nice. Matt is back, I believe. No, this is his first as well, I think. Yes, sir, that is correct. Number one. Sizemore is here for his, I believe, third appearance now. Um, and Joseph is here for the first time as well, our... Uh, our feature winner of the clash at the Coliseum. And we'll get into that. Um, just going to go ahead and go over the stats real quick from the clash. And then we can talk about it. So for the first heat, uh, we had Cliff Corvo actually winning the race with five laps led, and he had the fastest lap of the race with a 14.2. Uh, Matt Mettler finishing in second, obviously here, who finished uh, with seven laps led. And third was Chris Zofield. I think the biggest surprise with 28 laps led in that race. Uh, an incident between Mettler and Zofield on the final lap through the final two corners is what gave Cliff the win. So it was pretty cool to see. Uh, anybody's opinions on, on how that heat race went? Um, I was, was going to say, Matt, I, I love the final move at the end of the race. It was probably my favorite thing to watch that whole whole stream. Look, it, it really wasn't a move. It was more of a motivational gesture. I mean, <laughs> Joe Field, he's my uh, old teammate over there at uh, Yankinovsky. I mean, Sevenovsky Racing. And uh, I was just pumping him up, you know, and uh, kind of gotten there a little too uh, a little too hot, you know, didn't give him a break and kind of, uh, you know, knocked him out of the way and gave Cliff the win. But uh, Joe Field had a great run in that race, and uh, he was pretty quick. Found the AJ Amendiger of our league. <laughs> you gotta yeah. be somebody, right? Yeah, and uh, I'm not gonna lie, Amendinger is a pretty good guy to be. Uh, he's a little short, but he's, he's got a big personality, so it's Absolutely. pretty. It's yeah. it's pretty cool to see Mettler getting into that role uh, as he's getting better and, and progressing. So, um, yeah, the heat was very exciting. Uh, like I said, a short race. The, the surprise for me was definitely Zofield leading those 28 laps. I think that surprised a, a few people me included um they all three ended up moving on to the feature the feature included 12 cautions which was uh, kind of the theme of the race but you kind of expect that with the track like the clash at the la coliseum joseph grijalva i believe that's how you say it right if you could correct yeah. me okay cool awesome yeah, 20 laps led for him i believe there was 88 laps ran in the race so a little under a quarter of the race led uh, Chris D. Wheeler coming in second. Very strong run for him. And then I think we saw Jonathan Cogswell having a good race, and he did, in fact, finish third in that one. We'll look at the notable finishes here. Unfortunately, Thomas Fisher's not here, but the rookies had a really good class race. Thomas Fisher finished fourth with 15 laps led. Austin Wheeler, unable to make it tonight, finished sixth. And Ryan Gomes finished seventh. Had the most laps led in the clash at 28. It was pretty cool to see that. Uh, and then, unfortunately, we had the incident between DJ Daniel and Thomas Fisher on the lap 71 restart. That kind of shuffled them back towards the back. Fisher restarting first, DJ restarting third, going for a gap, as Ayrton Senna said. If you don't go for the gap, then you're not a racer. And he did. And uh, a little incident there between my driver and Ryan Sizemore's driver. But besides all of that, guys, what was y'all's opinion on the clash as a whole? <laughs> I, I, I just, I just want to... Uh... Even though I won, I, it was pretty pretty lucky. Uh, I think it was top three, top five at best uh, from my standpoint. But um, if it went under green, it it, it was fun. Uh, I just don't think we're uh, able to run it like most leagues. Uh, uh, it's just the nature of that track. I I would have rather finished fifth, but ran a actual race at Daytona or Charlotte, Vegas or whatever, something else. But uh, under green, it was fun uh, from my point of view. Yeah, yeah I think it was fun. There was quite a yeah. bit of getting and banging and some incidents, but for the most part, like uh, Joseph said, under green, it was a lot of fun. It just I mean, showed a lot of people's inexperience with short track racing. Um, I mean, you just had a lot of guys being up underneath other drivers that caused a lot of the incidents that happened instead of guys being, and I get people being excited to race, you know, technically the first race of the season 
Um, it was just guys being real overzealous on, you know, trying to dive into the corner. And that's what calls 95% of the incidents from the, from the broadcast booth where me, Lucas Whitehead and Chris Smith, uh, did the broadcast for it. So, and Matt Madler was there. <laughs> My bad, Matt. <laughs> oh, you're good brother. <laughs> For me, there's there's nothing NASCAR about the clash. Call me old school, whatever, and I'm fine with that. But, I mean, let's think about where it is, first of all. It's at the Coliseum, which was built for the stadium for the Los Angeles Rams. So it's a football stadium. I don't think, you know, 3,000-plus race cars, stock cars, have purpose being put inside that place. I mean, I was set for disaster on the start. I had never turned one lap there, and when I... Got out in the racetrack, I was like, oh my God, I can't think of any other track that races like this. And I think I even mentioned it to Cash. But uh, I want to see it go back to Daytona like uh, it's supposed to be. And um, I just think that's, in my mind, that's where I think it's all about. Daytona, Super Bowl of racing, you have speed weeks. Why are we diverting, you know, from that tradition, going all the way out to the West Coast, you know, and go playing NASCAR's version of football slash Olympics. Yeah, don't get me started on the medals. That's a whole other topic. But uh, I just like to see, you know, speed weeks be, you know, all about, you know, Daytona like it's been and, you know, getting off a place where you're supposed to be playing croquet at, you know, dining in with your grandmother. Yeah. Um, as far as uh, Ryan, we'll, we'll get to you and I uh, with being the, the team owners with the two guys involved in the, I guess you could call it the biggest incident of the night because it was the only thing people talked about after the race in the discord. Um, yeah. The lap 71 incident honestly looked just like a hard racing deal to me, but I could see where, where Fisher was coming from in the sense where there was initial contact and then more contact after that, after they got out of the corner, I, I kind of just chalk it up as it's just the racetrack. I don't think you have that any other short track. It's just, this thing is like a quarter mile long, I think. And it's, it's, there's like no room when, when you hit somebody, you're going to probably end up hitting them again. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. The, <clears throat> I guess the thing that starts our crew chief for Thomas during that one. And, um, I guess the thing that's done, you know, obviously he came out, you know, and caused the first incident there. Um, and kind of like what Cash was saying, you know, just being a little too excited, you know, too ready to go or whatever. Uh, went out and made a mistake, caused the incident. Uh, and then that second incident there, you know, he's on the inside on the exit there. And uh, the 22 gets loose on the exit. And, you know, when when the car's nose is pouring towards the inside wall and there's a car there bound to make contact. So yeah. uh, that got him. And so, you know, that was twice he had to come back from the back. Right. right. And uh, so drove himself through it twice and uh then gets you know into second place makes the pass on dj on the outside mm -hmm. um, and then drives off and then we had what two or three cautions after that where yep. after he got through one and two he was driving off and putting several car links between anyone uh and here we were i think tw with 12 to go like i was starting to think like damn you know pending nothing crazy happens he could win it right yeah i mean nobody after he got through like i said on a restart if he got through one and two he was pulling away. Yeah. Um, and, you know, guys battling behind him were just slowing him down, right? So, right. you know, it was kind of it was working into his favor. Uh, and then that last restart, I remember telling him, <laughs> I was like, DJ's behind you. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you have to say. Typically, any whitehead racing driver, uh, you could say that a, a whitehead racing driver is restarting yeah. behind you. It's not going to be pretty. Just hold on. So. So I said, I'm like, DJ's behind you. And he's like, oh, it's all right. It's all right. And I'm like, ah. <sighs> <laughs> right. I was like, well, and so we expected contact, right? right? But we what we expected was like maybe on the white flag lap, right? Yeah. Uh, but when we took ten to go, we came off the on the start there, right, went into turn one, and then boom, you know. So <laughs> uh, just a lot of frustration, really, more than anything. Yeah. I mean, like like you said, I think it's just racing, and it's it's a product of the track we're racing at. Right. You know? Yeah, and to kind of build off what you're saying, Ryan, about DJ being behind him, I know they. Fisher was driving a little aggressive and DJ's known to be a very aggressive driver in this league. Mm -hmm. Um, and in the broadcast booth, we were sitting there saying, you know, they made contact drivers have a short mind and looking for revenge as soon as they can get it. And as soon as that, that green flag dropped for that restart, DJ was using his bumper to push poor Fisher along the way. And, that's, <laughs> and I guess that's where the, the drama kind of stems. Yeah, from because, it is. Yeah. Because, I mean, outside looking in, if you didn't go back watch the replay, you just saw it from the angle we had on the broadcast. 
it kind of looked like DJ wrecked him on purpose, trying to get back at him. But I think it was just them trying to fit too many cars through a limp turn. Yeah. Yeah. And that was our thing too. We not, you know, we never once thought that DJ wrecked him on purpose. That was never, that never crossed our mind. Uh, we thought that, it, you know, and just from our uh, opinion and standpoint, it was just shitty, right? You know, just mm-hmm. locked it up or went in too heavy, whatever it is, right? But like Trey said, that's a, it, you know, that's a product of the track we're racing on. But no, we never thought it was intentional. We not once. Uh, we never thought it was intentional. And outside of that, uh, DJ had reached out to Thomas, I believe, last night, maybe, yeah. uh, to try, you know, talking things over. So uh, that's the cool thing about the clash is what, you know, it is a non points race. And yeah. Um, even if it were like Daytona or, or Charlotte or something like that, it's something that like this shit can play out now and you can learn a lot about yourself and the others. And then when it comes time to do the points racing, you know, you, you can remember those things right. and, and remember where that aggression can get you in trouble and where it can help you. Yep. And uh, to kind of piggyback off of that, Joseph, we'll start with you since obviously you won the race. Uh, like how did the track drive for you? I know, I know you had a pretty strong run and ended up being able to be there at the end when that incident happened to take the lead. Um, I just wanted to hear your opinion on how things went on the track. Well, yeah, as we went, I, I, uh, I think I started figuring it out uh, to get a, a good, like I said, top three, top five, a good uh, finish, even uh, after the, the early wreck, when uh, I think Fisher went three wide and we squeezed together. Yep. And then somebody hit somebody and there there was a car in my way off of four. So uh, I got stuck in the back. And then uh, just uh, wrecks, like I said, it's pretty lucky. I avoided the rest of the wrecks through the night. And uh, uh, when we did go green, it, it uh, all I really did is just send the brake bias all the way to the rear. Yep. So I can drive in hard and, and brake hard to, to kick the car around. Uh, it's, it's, it's usually my go-to for short tracks. So I'm like, well, I'll just do it again and see what happens. And, and sure enough, it worked. Uh, lucky for us, this car is pretty planted. It's it turns like a GT car. It races like a road car. Uh, uh, so it, it can uh, you can really get in those corners and coast them around. But, yeah. Um, as we went on, I started figuring it out. It, it was it was going pretty good. I uh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I like the track. If we went green, you know, with a couple handful of cautions, I mean, that would have been a blast. Uh, I, I would venture to say it's better than Daytona or I mean I, I hate play racing with a passion. I hate it so much. I'd rather do this all night than play race, but um that's just me because uh, I have I have uh, shitty luck with, with help at play races. But uh yeah it was it was a good track when we went green. Uh, I just uh, wish a little more green uh, flag racing would have been nice. Yeah I think for those of us that were watching the race I think that's what we wished for was more green flag racing with twelve cautions, eighty eight laps ran. I think over two thirds of the race was run under caution. Um, can't remember off the top of my head, uh, but yeah, it was. It did look like when we when you had two or three laps going, there was guys that were getting more comfortable sending it deeper into the corner and being able to make passes and and kind of nudge people, not really move them, but kind of nudge them and and do whatever they could. But um, we'll go through the list now. Uh, actually, we'll go through each individual person. I just want to know what your like who surprised you the most with either their finish or their performance. Uh, Brock, we'll go with you first. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say Thomas. Uh, I didn't really expect him to go into that race and be be that aggressive. Uh, obviously, we've seen him go wide on lap one, and it didn't work, but he figured it out. Like Ryan said, drove through the field two, two or three times and got up there. Uh, even after him and DJ's incident, he still got up there, and I think finished like top 10 so that really surprised me a lot yeah fisher finished fourth like i said and he did leave 15 out of the 88 laps which is a pretty significant amount if you're not able to make the passes like you normally could on an intermediate track for for him so cash who was your most surprising performer i'm gonna have to say fisher as well i mean he started off you know a little aggressive not being patient and it cost him spots just like it would on any other track um but he battled back through it he kind of leveled out you know, started backing up his corners a little bit more, you know, not trying to battle everybody out there on the track, just the guy next to him. And I mean, the results show for that. I mean, he raced a very good race. Yeah, I do agree with that. He did look pretty strong. I, I definitely underestimated his oval performance. And I don't know if you could really count this one as like a normal short track, but it looked pretty surprising to me. So uh, Medler, who is your most surprising performer? Well, again, 
Uh, and I'm going to go with uh, Cash and Brock as, as well. I mean, Fisher by far. I mean, just the way he put that race together start to finish. But outside of him, I think Zofield, you know, really, you know, hangs in my mind. I mean, the way he was able, you know, to put laps consecutively together in that heat race, you know, and then take that, what he gained from the heat race and applied it into, uh, you know, the feature at the Coliseum. I just think he he really uh, put on a, a great uh, performance there for his team and uh, was able to get him some self-confidence early. And I want to see if this carries over into, you know, uh, speed weeks here this upcoming week. But uh, Zofield uh, was definitely one that I thought overperformed or did much better than what I thought he would do out there. Yeah, I think the one thing that you can carry over track to track, you know, all we have all different kinds of tracks, like super short tracks and we have super speedways. You can't really carry a lot over through each track, but one thing that you can carry over is consistency. And I believe Zofield showed a lot of consistency in that heat race. Yep. And uh, I, I can't wait to see what he does at Daytona. So uh, for me, the most surprising performance, obviously you could say Fisher with him being a rookie, but I'm not going to copy everybody. I'm actually going to go with rookie Ryan Gomes. He led 28 laps in that race. And he looked really strong until the, the incidents where he got caught up because I, th- I don't know if you guys remember, but I think he got wrecked by somebody when he was running second or third. Uh, I believe it was when Fisher was actually leading the race. I mean, he just looked unreal to me and I can't wait to see what he does. Um, not just Daytona, but like the rest of the season. So, I mean, he, he might be the one to upset my rookie of the year pick. So, uh, Ryan, go ahead and pick your most surprising performer. Um. I would like to say Thomas uh, because it, it did surprise me too. I didn't expect him to, well, I, you know, I expected mistakes. I expected things to be rough, right? Yep. Um, and that's how it started. And uh, I thought everything was on par, but he, he truly surprised me with what he did after that, you know, uh, coming from the back so many times and, and being able to do what he did. It, it really did surprise me. But um, another one, honestly, is uh, Austin Wheeler. Uh, I'm pretty sure he said on the poll. I can't remember who sat on the pole, oh, but he, he did finish there, sixth. Yeah, he had uh, super fast lap times in the practice session. Um, and for what you know, like I said, I was crew chief and for Thomas, so just from that view, like it, it seemed like he really uh, ran a, a good race. And given the circumstances with so many cautions and wrecks and stuff, I mean, I think that that really shows that he's going to be a strong contender, especially for the rookie of the year. Yep. All righty, and Joseph, uh, last but not least, we'll go with your most surprising performer. Uh, I do want to jump on the Fisher bandwagon, I guess, and uh, I, I guess uh, surprising, but but more impressive, um, how how quick he was making passes on the outside. It's it's pretty hard. Uh, some small, weirdly straight track like this, and and then just uh, uh, regrouping after uh, getting in a wreck and, and re- resetting his brain. Like, all right, we gotta take a different approach. Uh, not to put him on a high horse though, because we we didn't really go green for a long run. That's what I'm curious about. It's right. after Daytona when we go to Vegas and Dover and Richmond, and we get long runs. How he's going to do? But that was pretty neat to see him. Uh, he just quickly move up to the the track like that. Yeah, Vegas is a track that I'm really looking forward to. Not just because I, I did really well in Vegas last year, but I believe we had one caution in that race, and it was. Yeah. 150 some odd lap green flag run that we went on two or three pit stops that people had to go through i mean people were making mistakes on pit stops pit stops not pit stalls but i guess you could say getting into their pit stall uh, it's like the daytona race last season if i remember correctly like we went what three quarters of the way through that, that race true. Yeah. Caution or maybe one caution and i think the next two or three races after that we hardly had any cautions yeah so, so that, the, 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 the season was kind of odd this league yeah. has proved that we can run green flag laps. We just got to get it figured out. So, yeah, I think the Vegas one was somebody's fun coming out of pit road. So, yeah, it was, really it was a pressure. Pressure. Spinning, yeah, we're spinning into pit road. One of the yeah, yeah. And I think same thing at Daytona. I think somebody clipped the apron and spun and got stuck on the banking. So, yep. All right. Well, we'll kind of piggyback off of what we were saying a moment ago about the LA Coliseum and if we should continue the clash at this race. I don't know if if I've seen a track more deserving than Daytona, because like Mettler said, like speed weeks is always Daytona. It's Daytona this, like we've got the shootout coming up this week, which we'll talk about. Um, Like it's supposed to be, you know, strictly Daytona until we get to week two of the season. Um, And then they kind of made the, we've made the jump to the, 
LA Coliseum and it's I don't know how this race would affect Hubka's decision on if it stays or goes somewhere else but I just want to know your opinions on it and where you think it actually should be so we'll go with Brock first yeah Daytona it's just where it has been even whenever I'm I was growing up I was always at Daytona and, and I don't think it should be at the LA Coliseum that's not a it's not a real racetrack it's just something that they lay down uh, in a couple of months and they pay too much money and it doesn't the good racing Daytona did. Yeah, Cash. What about you? Um, I get what they're trying to do with the LA Coliseum. They're trying to branch out to get more viewers from that side of the country because NASCAR is generally a more uh southern region sport. I mean, always has been. Um, but I mean, you can go back to Daytona. I mean, I'm totally okay with that. I mean, like everybody else, that's what I grew up watching. That's what I grew up loving. But, I mean, if they're wanting to run a different track in Daytona, maybe go to, like, North Wilkesboro or something like that if mm-hmm. they want to keep it a short track. Yeah, I think that'd be pretty cool. I know we've actually got North Wilkesboro in the first round of the playoffs, which I think is really cool. I can't wait to go race there. I've raced there a couple of times so far on iRacing, and it's really fun. It definitely could be. Uh, Mettler, what is your pick? When, you know, I got into NASCAR, or this goes for any new uh, fans coming in, too. When you think Daytona, I mean, that is like biblical in the sense of NASCAR. You hear about racing on the beaches and then Bill France and these guys building this mecca of racing, the Daytona super, you know, super speedway, you know, speed weeks. I mean, that's a major attraction. That's a huge draw. And, you know, one of the one of the biggest things about that is, is you have, you know, multiple weeks of racing action and to take that and strip that legacy and then throw it out west because, you know, you're trying to get a little bit more of, uh, you know, a little uh, or trying to broaden your reach and trying to, you know, uh, you know, increase your scope. Now, I'm all about that. You know, I definitely want to see the sport grow. I definitely I feel everyone has it should have the opportunity to be present at a NASCAR race. Absolutely. But not. When you're talking about Daytona, that needs to remain, you know, how it's been, you know, over, you know. 20, 30, 40 years. I'm not sure how many years at the top of my head, but it needs to remain at Daytona. But and again, that's just my opinion, but that's what I would like to see. Yeah, I think for me, it would definitely be uh, Daytona as well. I wouldn't mind, actually, like if it had to be somewhere else besides Daytona, like a Charlotte, I mean, type of all-star early kind of thing. I don't know, like an exclusive, like how they do it now. I like the format that they have now. I just don't like the track. I think the track just doesn't produce great racing and it's like fake NASCAR, I would say. So, um, yeah, I would say Charlotte if it wasn't Daytona. Uh, Ryan, what about you? Um, you know, like a lot of guys, I grew up watching NASCAR in the, in the early to mid nineties and there's a, something aesthetically pleasing about preseason Daytona. You come off of the Rolex 24 every year and then usually what the next week or two you're running the clash. Right. Right. So, uh, and that during the whole time, you, you know, like you said, the speed weeks, the whole thing, it's, it's a whole thing that takes up the entire first part of the year. Right. Um, and, and so to me, that that is what defined NASCAR when it came to preseason. It's like the festivities leading up to the Super Bowl. Right. Uh, and that, that's how I look at NASCAR as well. Uh, it's the, the, the clash and the shootouts and the duels. All, it's all festivities leading up to the big show. Um, and that's how I grew up, and, and I'll always believe in that. You know, Dale Jr. said it best on his podcast when he talked about it. You know, they're doing it for a good reason, right? I understand branching out, reaching out, trying to get a, a, a broader audience. Um, but I also think that when NASCAR listens to NASCAR fans is when NASCAR starts making mistakes because NASCAR fans are the most toxic fan base in all sports history. Um, and I think that the idea of branching out and and trying to grab a new fan base and and get more worldwide, as you would say, is great, but ruining the racing product while trying to chase that is not going to gain fans, right? The people going to the Clash are going for the music, right? They're going for the, the artists that are performing there. You can watch when they, you know, the stands, they got plenty of people there, but during the racing, where's everybody looking? They're not, they're not even paying attention to the race. Yeah. Right, people's going to the concession stands during the race, and then being attentive during the the halftime concert show, as you'd call it. You know, uh, so to me, that's just 
I'm fine with it. I was fine with it the first year. It's something new. I'm fine with that. That's cool. Um, I would like to see it go back to Daytona, but if not, I think using some of the old historical NASCAR tracks, I think would be, in my opinion, the coolest way to go about the clash moving forward if they didn't keep it at Daytona. So Wilkesboro, Rockingham, you know, stuff like that. The old traditional tracks. If they wanted to implement something new with the clash, I think it should be something like that. Yep. And uh, Joseph, what about you? Your thoughts on the the clash, where it is, and where it should be? Um, I, I dig it. I, I dig the the they tried something. Uh, it's okay. You know, maybe it didn't work. Uh, I think they should move it around. Um, go to Daytona, and then go somewhere else. Go to Charlotte. Go to Vegas. Go to Dover. Go just try other places, or do it somewhere else. Uh, Daytona uh, tradition. I get it. Uh, like everybody, I grew up. I'm 31. I grew up racing with racing, watching racing. Uh, the earliest race I can remember was when I was four, watching Jeff Gordon on a big tube TV racing around. And, and Daytona, back in the day, uh, uh, my biggest deal with, with plate racing in general is back in the day, they didn't need to rely on people so much. I didn't need to have a drafting partner. I didn't need to have someone to push me. Right? That's how it was back then. Now the cars are so equal. They suck up so well. The bumpers line up better now. But I need that help coming off. And, and it, it, to me, that's not racing. Uh, in my opinion, I shouldn't have to rely on someone so I can win a race. It should be just me, be me and my team. I need you to push me to pass that guy. And we're freight training around the top of the racetrack or the bottom, whoever's leading. Like, that's not racing to me. We should have a good run like Vegas. It will spread out. I'm taking care of my car and whatever. And that's how it should be, in my opinion. And and that's why I think they should move it around and get those intermediate tracks in play. Hell, try a road course. You know, I mean, road racing is fun too. A lot of people like it. Yeah, I think uh, I think they should just move it around every year. Yeah, they did the Daytona Road Course. I want to say 2020 for the Clash. Was it? I think that was for the Clash. I can't remember. Yeah, I, yeah 2020 or 2021, I believe. Yeah, I think Chase Elliott yep. ended up winning that after he spun Blaney coming out of the final corner, which I remember obviously because I'm a big Blaney <laughs> fan. So, uh, but yeah, moving it around would be a good idea. I think tracks that are losing their like second dates because you know we're getting we're getting a lot of new tracks coming in. So like Texas. They've only had one date. I know it's an awful racetrack right now. Yeah, Bristol. I mean, yeah. So any track that is losing their second date in the regular season or in the playoffs, I think it would be cool to use that track or one of those tracks for for the clash. Um, Just looking at the upcoming shootout at Daytona on Thursday, um, I've gotten word from Hubka. It is everybody is racing. I'm not sure about the laps. I think it's 2530, I would want to guess, because it's a short, it's a little race. But um, everybody's racing in it, uh, so I guess we can go through and, and see who we think would win it, like just little predictions. Um, and then that should be that should be it. So, Brock, who do you have, what are you looking forward to, actually, in the, in the shootout, and then who do you think is going to win? Yeah, I'm looking forward to learn how the, to learn how the car drives. We haven't got to try the day. Uh, we don't know how it does in the draft. Obviously, we qualify. That's way different than what the race setup is probably going to be like. So I'd like to learn and see how the car sucks up and how the top line runs. Obviously, for the prediction, I would like to say myself. But I'm going to go with somebody. Uh, probably about Ryan Gomes. He was fast at the clash. And I think if he can draft really good and, and figure it out, I think he can win it. Okay. Cash, what about you? Um, I mean, it's... It's your plate race, man. I mean, it's it's luck of a draw if you got a good drafting partner. Um, it's kind of con- it's really kind of hard to say who's going to win it. I mean, I'm excited for it. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna be racing, broadcasting, or doing both, but either right. way, I'm gonna be there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but I mean, I can't say myself. I can't say Brock. I really can't say anybody. I mean, it's just gonna come down to if he can keep it out front, keep it clean, and stay out of the big ones. So it's kind of a crapshoot. Yeah, whoever's left standing has a really good chance at winning the race. So, uh, Mettler, what about you? I agree with Cash 100%. You know, plate racing, is that's the great equalizer. If you put a trailer in the infield, you can leg- legitimately go out there on the track and win the race. As far as who I think is going to, you know, shine through and perform well, I think the 96 is going to be really strong. He showed a lot of poise, um, patience in the late races, especially last year, knows how to put himself in contention, use the draft. But what I'm concerned about is, especially for me, because big manufacturer change, you know, coming over from uh, Sebanovsky into a Toyota, having very limited seat time in Toyotas in 
uh, pack situations. And then not only that, the, the big wild card here is the setup. What is that going to be like? Because we don't know. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to use this clash for every little bit of, uh, you know, for every ounce of track time I can get. I just want to be able to go out there and learn and figure out what my car is going to do and then apply that, you know, in the duels and so forth. Yeah, um, like you said, if you put a if you put a trailer in the infield, you have a chance to win the race. And I, and I feel I truly feel like with this field, anybody can win. Um, so uh, picking the winner is like winning the lottery, I guess. I'm going to actually go out on a limb, and I think I'm going to pick Austin Wheeler just because of how well he raced during the fundraiser colon cancer awareness race. Um, but the thing I'm looking forward to the most is getting on track with all the new guys and seeing how they race. Um, I, I think I'm going to take the shootout and the duels next week as a figuring out point on how I'm going to race the big race. Uh, I, I would just look at these as practices just to see how everybody's racing. Because, I mean, Cash, you could race differently this year than you did last year and vice versa. I could race differently this year than I did last year, have a different mindset. So just kind of feeling out these next couple of weeks up to the big Daytona race. Uh, Ryan, what about you? Uh, I think with the Clash, the biggest thing that separates it from, like, the big Daytona race um, is that it is so short. Uh, we can all come in with some type of a game plan or a strategy for the big Daytona race, right? You know, we get a fast repair. We can plan for getting junked at least once, right? Being yep. able to fix it and come back. Um, and I guess we're going to have one in the, in the shootout as well. But um, I think that with it being so short... You're, you're, you don't really have time to sit back and, and formulate some type of plan to get to the front. I think it's more of a you've really got to take every single run you get, fill every gap you can, uh, because you don't have the time to sit there. You just don't. Uh, 30 laps will go by quick. Yep. Very, very quick. Uh, so that's what I'm looking forward to the most, seeing how everyone you know evolves to such a short, quick super speedway race like that, because that's not what we usually do. You know, we're usually running 100 laps at it. So uh, that that's, you know, what, I'll be, what I'm thinking out when I think about the race. Uh, Prediction-wise, though, like everyone said, you know, it's hard to pick. And with this style, with it being so quick, it makes it even harder. Uh, I can say who can put together a long race at Daytona or Talladega and make it to the end. We have plenty of guys that do it every single season. Uh, but again, the aggression and everything, it's non-points race. You know, so all that kind of plays into me not being able to really pick anybody i'd love to say myself but again you know if you two wrecks and that's it yep you know, so i i don't really i can't make a prediction there's people i'd love to see win it um but i i really honestly can't sit here and say that there's somebody i could pick yeah i think kind of piggybacking off what you're saying i'm very uh brock, well i know brock is usually very aggressive about trying to make sure he stays up front no matter what I think this short race will bring out that aggressiveness in some drivers so that they can test and see how aggressive they can be on passes and when they should take the runs and fill the gaps, like you said. So it'll be a lot of fun to see that. Uh, Joseph, uh, what about you? Uh, yeah, just like they said, it's it's up in the air, at least um, from my standpoint, anybody can win it. it it's uh, skill isn't that big of a factor, in my opinion here. It's more mental uh, chess game. And a lot of luck. Hopefully, you don't get wrecked, get turned, or get into somebody else's mess. Uh, I can tell you, it probably won't be me because I usually get into other people's wrecks 99.9% of the time at play tracks. Uh, yeah. It's just my luck. Uh, so they hate me, and that's okay. But uh, <laughs> anybody, anybody can win it. Anybody can win it. I uh, just cannot personally wait till we uh, get past play the Daytona uh, weeks. Yeah, it's, we've got a, a grueling three weeks for you then. If that's if that's what you're looking forward to is week number two. We've got three straight weeks of, of Daytona coming up. So I am looking forward to it. Uh, but I, I don't know. Like you said, it could be a crapshoot for me all three weeks. We'll just have to figure it out. You can do really well in the shootout, in the duels, and then just get taken out in the big race. And it meant nothing for those three weeks. So um but yeah that pretty much wraps it up i appreciate all you guys for coming on i, I noticed the the two webcams that we got on from brock and cash so uh hopefully i'll get one here pretty soon and uh we're, we're trying to eliminate the the stale background of just the discord images so i appreciate you guys for doing that but yeah we're not going to have a special episode this week 
uh, we'll just film again next week and, and put another episode out next Tuesday after the shootout. And, and we'll be looking forward to the duels at that point. So, uh, be sure to tune into the ghost racing network on YouTube and on Facebook. And, uh, like I said, the shootout is this Thursday. Uh, can't wait to be on track with all of you guys. Like cash said, he's not sure if he'll be just broadcasting or, or racing or doing both. Um, uh, not sure with me either. I might, I might hop in the broadcast booth. Um, we'll have to see. So yeah, just check it out this Thursday. It'll be live, I believe, at 8 p.m. Central Time, which would be 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and yeah, that's pretty much it. So we'll see you guys next Tuesday.